It was, uh, 1993, I think. You know, after, after a while, these things start to blend together. Dates, some names. I'm an old man now. That doesn't help. But I remember the important things. I don't know if it's that I just have a good memory or if these things just kind of get burnt in your mind. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, we drew a body in a department store. Cole's department store, you know. The one right up there on North Avenue. This one started off weird right off the bat. Someone placed the call for the body at about 2 in the afternoon. It was a department store that opened at 9 in the morning. It had been open. People walking around the place for hours. So we think, okay, maybe. Maybe the body was hidden somewhere in the building. Nope. Body was right inside the main entrance of the place. Right by the first checkout. Somebody must have dropped the body there. Took off, right? These are all things we're thinking all on the drive over. Um, body was posed. There was no way people had been in a rush when they did, and there was no way that people just didn't notice someone doing it. It would have been impossible to miss. I mentioned that it was a kid. Yeah, he was, um, maybe 10, 11 years old. Pose was, um, uh, you've watched The Exorcist. Um, the girl come down the stairs. She bent over backwards. She's walking on her hands and feet. That's how this boy was, but, you know, um, he wasn't moving. His back was arched, stomach facing up, just looking up at us, upside down. His face just pain, just pain. All he had on was a pair of white briefs, this kid. God. Uh, so we get there, and the first thing we ask is, well, what the guy looked like. Someone had to have seen him, but no. No one could recall. No one could recall seeing anything. Not even, uh, not even the lady who'd been standing at the register. This poor kid was posed in front of him, not ten feet away. Now it's weird enough, you know, the way this body's position positions weird enough. So we think rigor mortis must have set in. Forensics folks get over there, take these pictures, all of them. Christ. Then. Uh, and then they, you know, they get ready to lay the body out, take a closer look at him, and as soon as the forensics guy, uh, Benny, remember his name is, uh, as soon as Benny lays a finger on him, I meant the moment, the second, the microsecond, the exact instant his finger touches this kid's shoulder, the body instantly crumples like a deflated balloon. I feel bad saying it, that poor kid, but it was just a puddle of a person, it's a puddle of skin. I found out later this kid's bones are just... They're dust. I don't mean like figuratively either. His bones were ground to just a fine, fine powder. Only mark of his body was a handprint around his neck. The cause of his death was determined to be strangulation. Christ. It's a goddamn kid. Yeah. Anyway, we had our work cut out for us. This was a, this was a case where there were 40, 50, 60 witnesses. We checked the security cameras, and it was the most bizarre surreal thing the whole thing was caught up on tape and around um 10 30 that morning a person wearing all black kept his head down the whole time we couldn't see his face he came in holding the um kid's hand they went over where the body was found the kid goes into the position we found him the guy then chokes the kid for about 40 seconds and killing him people are just walking on by Walking around him, looking at him, ignoring what's happening. The lady at the counter looks over a few times, didn't do anything, just kept checking people out, doing her job. Guy finishes choking the kid, he stands up, and son of a bitch bows. And the part that really got me, people in the store gave him a round of applause. And he just left. No, we're fuming. I remember I yelled at some of the employees and people that were in the store when we got there. What the hell were you doing just standing there? What the hell's the matter with you, sons of bitches? You know, like, but not a one of them couldn't really explain the reaction to what had happened. They said they remembered seeing the guy, the kid, all of it. But when it happened, it didn't really feel like anything wrong was going on. They said they all just saw it. But instead of being like, what the hell, it just, it just seemed like a, uh, normal thing 
We asked everyone what the guy had looked like. They were all 100% sure in the description they gave of the guy's face, but what the witnesses gave us... The guy was either white, black, Hispanic, or Asian, with brown, black, blonde, red, or gray hair, blue, green, or brown eyes, perfectly smooth or extremely wrinkled skin, a big or a small nose, and he had a picture-perfect set of pearly whites. Or, he had a mouth that looked like he ate nothing but junk food and rocks, and then brushed a day in his life. Didn't make any sense. And with everyone having no real idea what they saw, none of what they gave us was a help at all. Remember I said the body was called in around 2 in the afternoon, and yeah, that means people were coming in and just ignoring, not realizing, I don't know, whatever the hell was happening, but no one did anything about the body for almost four hours. We went to listen to the 911 call. We find out it came out from the came from a payphone right around the street from the Coles, the McDonald's there. There used to be a payphone. Now I heard a gravelly, deep voice. But Olsen, he heard someone more high-pitched. Doesn't really matter. It's another weird thing about this. Operator goes, 911, yada, yada, yada. Guy says, did anyone call yet? Operator goes, I'm sorry? Did anyone call about the body yet? There's a wet body. Guy gets all frustrated, starts huffing and puffing. and goes, there's a body at Coles, North Avenue. Do your freaking job. Your goddamn job, whatever he says. And he goes, I don't have all day. So we end up looking at the security tapes in McDonald's there, right after the guy um, did what he did to the um, to the boy. Walked over to the McDonald's, he sat at one of the tables outside, and he just sat there, staring at the coals, just waiting. Didn't budge an inch from 10.35 until he called at 2. Just sat there, like a statue, staring. Then he got up and he made the call. After he hung up, he stood at the payphone. Not moving, watching the coals from there, watching the black and white show up, watching us show up, and finally around four, he just left. Took off down the street. This was one where we didn't really find anything, never found out who the boy was, no one ever reported him missing. Certainly never found the guy that killed him. Get this though. Whole mess of people that were in the store, when he did what he did, they ended up killing themselves. Six or, six or seven of them in the months immediately following. And then, then I find out, the case was reopened, the guy took over, a young guy named Smith, he, uh, he went to re-interview some of the witnesses, 16 more committed suicide, the guy didn't just kill the boy, whatever he did, whatever he was, um, he took a whole lot more people with him, that boy though, <sighs> never get that sad out of my eyes, he just... He was posed. I just, thank God I never saw anything like that again. Some of the other cases I might have... It might have affected me more overall. But that... Oh, that, that was a sight, that... That was that one. I love my wife, Lily, dearly. She's always been my best friend. I was devoid of love and affection for most of my life until she came along eight years ago. I've been in love ever since. I've been married for five years now. You realize you love someone you, when you're, you're ready to do anything for them. And I'd do anything for Lily. If she said that the sky was red, it was red. If it wasn't, I'd paint it red. We had a beautiful daughter, 28th of March, three years ago. Named her Dorothy, after Lily's grandmother. And that's when things started to get strange. One morning, my beloved Lily woke up and said, I need to tell you something. I can't keep it in any longer. I don't expect you to understand, but you're the only person I can trust. At first, I thought she was joking. She was sweating profusely, and her eyes told me that this wasn't some silly prank. Yes, darling, what's wrong? I asked. I get visions. And I can see into the future, she said, her lips trembling with each word. Wait, so, like a psychic, I asked? I don't know. I've always kept it to myself, but it seems like I have this gift, and I've had it since my pregnancy. I said nothing about this to anyone. But darling, you're an atheist who prides herself in trusting logic and facts over everything else. 
I thought we both were like that. Do you really believe that you can see the future? You don't have to believe me just yet. I don't believe myself either. I just know that I have this gift now. I have these visions looking at certain people and places and they come true. They always come true. I tried keeping this to myself, but after what I saw today, I had to let you know. Your mother will die tomorrow. What? What are you saying? Yes, just go over there now. Don't ask questions. My mother lives with her sister, upstate. It was a four-hour drive away. I hope Lily was wrong, but I didn't want to take the risk. I went out. And to this day, I can't explain what happened next, but it certainly made me believe that my wife was psychic. When I was an hour away from her place, I received a call from my mother's sister telling me that my mother had slipped and fallen in the bathroom. She died from the concussion. Lily was right. This was not a coincidence. Over the next few weeks, Lily got visions of minor things like, what would I get to see at work? Who would visit us during the weekend? What Christmas presents I had bought and kept hidden from her? And she was right every time. We learned to live with it. Slowly. Unless the visions were tragic, like someone close getting fired or dying. I didn't believe in these things throughout my life, but it was hard being a non-believer when you're seeing these events happen with your own eyes in your own life. I asked her why she didn't tell me about her gift earlier, but she said that she had no idea about it. It was only when she was pregnant that she, she started getting these visions. I still love Lily. I always would. That never changed. If she said that the sky was red, it was red, and if it wasn't, I'd paint it red. Things were all right for a while. I'd like to believe that this was the time in our lives that we were truly happy. I love Lily, my beautiful little girl Dorothy. Lily loved Dorothy and spent most of her time playing with her. They were both so adorable. Filled my heart with happiness every single day. We were happy and love raising a beautiful child. Her having psychic gifts was just a bonus at that point. However, not all love stories have a happy ending. Ours, unfortunately, wasn't an exception. Last year, Dorothy died because of a heart condition that couldn't be remedied. Lily was devastated, and so was I. It's the toughest and darkest time of our lives, and I knew that I had to be strong for her. I was her only shoulder to cry on. But most of the time, I broke down alone in rooms of silence, and I was sure she wasn't nearby. Could never get over that, and I knew Lily couldn't either. She spent her nights crying and clutching onto me. She spent her mornings waking up and crying. On most days, I tried to calm her down, but on the few days when my heart couldn't handle the unbearable pain of our loss, we held each other and cried. Our perfect life was over. Weeks went by like this. Lily ate less, stopped going out of the house altogether. I couldn't, I couldn't bear to see her heartache, but there was nothing I could do. I was sure that something inside Lily had shattered, and she wasn't the same person ever since. She didn't talk during the day, and during the night, she cried. She stared at Dorothy's crib. She broke down crying every time she looked at her. I tried my best to be there for her. I, I, I loved her more than anything else. And seeing her in such misery reminded me of the blissful times in our lives that we both had taken for granted. Also seemed that her gift of getting visions went away with the passing of our daughter. She used to stare at the walls and ceilings, hoping for visions, and whenever she got one, claimed to get one, she told me about them. It didn't come true. Her gift was gone. And she had become a soulless, depressed version of the woman that I had once known. It was perhaps that Dorothy had something to do with it. And she started getting these visions when Dorothy came into this world and lost it with her passing. I'm sure she realized this as well, but she wasn't ready to accept it. Now, a few weeks later, she told me that she saw, in a vision, that our neighbor's dog had died. Like all her visions since Dorothy had died, I thought this one would not come true. However, things were different the next morning. For the first time since Dorothy's passing, I saw Lily smile. 
The neighbor's dog died. The neighbor's dog. It died, she said. My gift is back. Do you understand what this means? Uh, no, Lily, I said, still trying to process everything. It means I can see the future again, she said, and hugged me. I held her tightly and hugged her. For the first time since Dorothy passed away, she wasn't crying as soon as she woke up. Rather, she was happy. You don't believe me, do you? She asked. I do, I said, and kissed her. She kissed me back with eyes wide open, and I realized then that something was still wrong with her. However, I still loved her, and I always would. Losing her own daughter and recovering from the shock isn't going to be a pleasant experience, but I sincerely hoped she hadn't gone crazy. The next few days went by normally. Lily was less upset. Getting her gift back seemed to bring a new ray of hope into her life. She told me that in one of her visions, she saw that her abusive brother would die within a week. Her brother was an abusive leech to both her parents, and it was obvious that Lily wanted him to die. Are you sure this is a vision and not just your fantasy? I said, expecting her to laugh at the joke. No, he'll die, she said in a straight voice. Her brother died, and the police are still investigating his murder. Someone had stabbed him in his throat and left him to die in his car. When the police came over to our place for questioning, Lily gave me a look I'll never forget. While the police weren't looking, she looked at me and smiled from ear to ear. As she never liked her brother, but even after hearing the news about his death, she wasn't affected. The police went away, but they're still investigating this. I just hope to God they don't they don't come by knocking again. I think Lily's getting happier, though. She talks to me more frequently. She doesn't cry anymore. Last week, Lily told me that she saw Mr. Hudson, or Badmouth Billy, as he was known in the neighborhood, would die. Sure enough, he died the next day with a knife stuck in his spine. I saw Lily happy again when she got the news. She knew that they were dead as soon as she told me of her vision. It might seem weird. Most of my wife's predictions about people dying were being fulfilled by them being murdered. It's also a weird coincidence that these people were people she wasn't fond of. Rather, she strongly disliked them. So, I know what you're thinking. It's her. She's killing these people to fulfill her visions because after Dorothy's death, she has gone crazy. But, I've always loved my wife. I know that whatever Lily is, she's not a killer. She isn't capable of doing this. I know she's not a killer. She, I know she's not, because... Because... I am. Poisoning a dog and stabbing two men in the dark were easy. I'd do it all over again for her. I'll keep fulfilling all her visions, if that's what it takes to see a smile on her gorgeous face. As I said, I'd do anything for her. If she said that you were going to die, you'd die. I'll make sure you do. If she said the sky was red, it was red. If it wasn't, I'll paint it red. There's been a tornado warning for the past three days. I don't think what's outside is a tornado. I live in the Midwest. I won't say where, that's irrelevant, but I live in an area that's prone to weather warnings, specifically tornadoes. You mostly get them between April and June, but it's not too unusual to get them later in the year. What is unusual, however, is having them last for three days. It began three days ago. I had just gotten home for another boring day's work and had plopped myself down on the couch with a beer, microwave dinner, and my dog. Sam, a small rescue dog. I don't know her exact breed. I plan on getting a little drunk and falling asleep to some bad late-night TV, my usual weekday routine, when I was rudely interrupted by my TV and phone blasting a tornado warning. Looking outside, I could see that it was a little stormy, but it definitely didn't look like tornado weather. Sighing, I pulled myself off the couch, took my dog and dinner down into the cellar below the house. I only realized after I closed the door that I forgot my beer. Now, my cellar is just as glamorous as my house. I'm sure you can imagine what that means. Walking down the stairs, my hand made it way across the wall before finding the light switch. I knew that power wouldn't last for long, so I began to warm up the generator. 
After that, I double-checked that I had some food and water before sitting down in my old chair that I kept down there, switching on my radio. And uh, I, I figured at least getting half an hour of radio signal before it was distorted and eventually washed away by the storm. While I began finishing off my dinner, the radio crackled to life. Emergency weather alert broadcast from Summer County, Kansas. Residents are advised to stay indoors or in a storm shelter and to shut all windows. Residents are also advised to lock all doors, barricade cellar entrances, and not to answer any call for help or request for entry until an official signal. Stay safe. Good luck. Wait, wait what? I said, bolting upright and almost choking on my food. I, I quickly leaned forward and turned up the radio volume, hoping to catch a warning for a second time. Residents are advised to lock all doors, barricade cellar entrances, and not to answer any calls for help or request for entry until an official signal. Stay safe. Good luck. The radio had finally cut out. Just as rain began to pelt the roof of the rest of the upstairs, no matter, I had heard it again, for certain. Lock all doors, barricade cellar entrances, and not answer any call for help or request for entry until an official signal. They played again in my head. I, but don't get me wrong, this isn't my first rodeo when it comes to big storms or even tornadoes. I've spent countless hours holed up in here while rain, lightning, tornadoes, and hail wreaked havoc above me, but never in my life have I been told to lock my doors or, or not to answer any call for help or request for entry. Now, that was weird. Initially, I played it off as possibly being looters who would enter the homes of hiding people to rob them. It's happened before, but never during a storm, and never to such an extent to where the county would warn about them. Besides, looters don't try to alert homeowners to their presence. Anyway, I tried my best not to think about it. Eventually drifted off to sleep much later than I would have, probably due to boredom. With nothing to do other than to listen to the pelting rain above you, it's pretty hard to stay awake. I was awoken around 3 a.m., Sam barking and growling at the cellar door. It was weird. She never barked in storms, only at people at the door or some other dogs. I walked up the stairs to rest my ears against the cellar door, and all I could hear was the heavy rain and occasionally some thunder. It was weird. The tornado should have passed by now, but we still didn't get an official signal. Not like I would have slept through it. I'm a light sleeper, and I made sure the radio volume was up real high. Just as I was about to go back to my chair, I hear it. The creak of my front door opening. Gosh, shoot, thought to myself. I forgot to lock it. Sam started barking louder, despite my attempts to shush her. The house was quiet for a moment. I used this time to stick a wooden board between the door handles, making the door almost impossible to open from the outside. And I heard it. Footsteps. They were light, but they were definitely there. I followed them with my ears as they made their way around my house. It was, it was hard to pinpoint where they were, but I definitely heard them in my living room on the carpet and going, going up the stairs and into my bedroom. My eyes rushed around the room as panic rose. I felt like there was a, a pit in my stomach. I was nauseated with fear. I, I left my rifle upstairs. Down here, the best excuse for weapon was the couple of inch-long steak knives I had brought down before. Switched off the cellar light, which I stupidly left on before, and stuck my eye in between the two cellar doors, the ones that opened out into my house. Now Sam had quieted down, but she was still growling. My eyes glanced around the limited field of view that it had. I could see my couch, stairs, closed door to my bathroom, not too much. It was then that I noticed that the footsteps had stopped. Is this what the radio had warned about? I thought over the scenario in my head, looters... Someone seeking shelter? A wild animal, maybe? None of it made sense. Then there was the knock. I wasn't sure if I heard it properly at first, but it quickly progressed from a quiet tapping to a banging crescendo. It sounded like thousands of fists had descended upon my cellar door, thrashing and pounding against it. Whoever, or whatever, was banging, I knew I couldn't let it in. This must have been what the radio had warned me about. Instinctively, I jumped back and I nearly fell backwards down the stairs, leading into my cellar. Surprisingly, I composed myself and I yelled at whoever was out there. Hey, get out of my house! I'm armed! I shouted. I don't think I was too convincing, perhaps thanks to the slight tremble in my voice. The banging on my door stopped. Did I scare it away? I thought to myself. 
It was quiet for a few minutes, but the uneasy silence was shattered when it spoke. Hey, man, uh, you need to let me in. It's really dangerous out here. I, I don't know how long I can last. Impossible. It's the voice of my brother. I hadn't seen him in years. Not since we moved to the West Coast. There was no, there was no possible way that he was in, he was in the state. Oh, he didn't even know where I lived. Every ounce of my being knew that whatever spoke was definitely not my brother, but something else. And yet, yet I still replied. Mark. Yeah, it's been a while. Let, let me in. I I need to see you. At the end of a sentence, his voice trailed off. It was deeper. It was almost raspy. That wasn't the voice of my brother at all. I knew I couldn't respond. I spoke again. Oh, look, Alec. Uh, the love of God, let me in. It's dangerous out here. The storm is strong. I didn't give it the satisfaction of reply, which only seemed to make it more angry. Let me in! It screamed out of frustration. Its screams were sickening. A, a wail that filled the air and made me want to throw up. And after that, it started banging on the door again. It was quiet for a couple of hours after that. The storm continued, seemingly without a tornado, however. I was startled to hear my radio crackle back to life. Emergency weather alert canceled. Residents are advised to leave their cellars to secure properties. That is all. <sighs> I let out a sigh of relief. And, uh, however, my relief was short-lived. The broadcast seemed... well, off. Usually at the end of a storm, there would be a damage report, uh, locations where you could go to to receive aid and maybe a bed for the night. Plus, I could still hear the rain and thunder above me. There was no way a signal could get through it. It must have somehow hijacked my radio signal. Even though I didn't give any response to the message, my radio continued to say that I could leave. Every few minutes, the same line would be repeated. With perfect sound quality, it was enough to make me want to unplug the thing altogether. If I wasn't afraid of missing the actual end signal. Since all that, it's been rather quiet. For three days have passed not, without the storm or my, my radio subsiding. That thing, whatever it is, it's still out there. It's occasionally banging on my door to remind me. I'm at my wit's end. If it wasn't for Sam, I... I think I would have gone insane by now. It's the eve of the fourth day now. Storm isn't showing any signs of stopping, not from, not from what I can hear anyway. Reading through my last post, a lot of you gave me some really good advice. The ones that I ended up putting into action. I managed to get a few little, a few little chunks of sleep over the past few days. I mean, it's hard. The thing in my house occasionally bangs on the door and calls for me to open it. My stupid radio is blasting that same message. I've not been asleep, however. I've been digging out the back of the cellar. See, when I first bought this house, the previous owner told me there was a cellar door that opened to the outside, but it was buried under a pile of rubble after the walls, either side of the cellar, collapsed. Strange, but I think it might be my only hope. In my last post, a user recommended that I should try and call one of my neighbors. I have a landline stored down here, so I tried to give it a ring. For the first few calls, I got no response. I assume they're either evacuated or it was stored inside of their house. I was about ready to give up when that thing outside of my, my door spoke again. You're not going to get through to him. I can help. Let me, let me in. I will help you. I have food and, and water, you know. Food and water? Thank God wasn't the issue. I even had a couple of sacks of dog food for Sam, so she wasn't going to go hungry. Sam actually seemed to enjoy the situation, when she wasn't barking at the thing outside the door. Also, someone on my last post made a comment about me using a dog as a distraction while I run for it, and while the idea is definitely valid, I'm afraid I couldn't do that to Sam. See, she's been with me through thick and thin. Even though my cellar is a bit decrepit, I still keep it constantly stocked with supplies for this exact situation. Um, maybe, not, maybe not this exact situation, but one where I have to stay down here for a few days. Anyway, I tried one last time to call my neighbors. And this time, thank God they actually picked up. Hello? Uh, Mr. Robinson? I tried not to sound too shaky on the phone. Yeah, do you need help, Alec? I paused. I couldn't tell them about what was outside my door. They, they wouldn't believe me and probably just, they'd probably just tell me to go. Mr. Robinson would come over and 
potentially risk his life by initiating contact with that thing. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in a bit of a spot. Hey, I'm running out of food and water and my, my generator's broken. Would it be all right if I stayed with you guys until the storm's out? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be okay. Uh, we still have plenty of supplies, so come on over. Just knock on the door on the back of the house and we'll let you in. All right, all right. Good, yeah, thanks. I'll see you then. I hung up and I prayed to God that I, I had actually just spoken to Mr. Robinson and not, not whatever the hell was out there. I had a hunch that it, I was safe going over there, though, because if it was that thing that had picked up the phone, I think it would have been much more keen for me to go. Despite its incredible ability to change its voice, subtlety is something it lacks. In the time between these posts, I've also done some research about what it is. See, a commenter in my last post said that it could have been a Wendigo. And I'll be honest, I've never heard of the thing outside of a couple of horror stories. It says on the Wikipedia page that it's a man-eating creature that has some human characteristics, but also that it resides in a forest region in the East Coast, the Great Lakes. So I... I don't know if one could get all the way down to Kansas. Oh, although I don't know quite what it is. I know that I do not want to come into contact with it. Before I made a mad dash in my neighbor's yard, I had to work out how to distract the thing. I mean, luckily, I still knew that it was right above me, due to it constantly banging on my door, looking through the crack in between the two doors. I, I, I still couldn't see anything, despite the constant banging. I mean, I'll be honest. Kind of thankful for that. I think I, I would have had a heart attack if I looked out and saw an eyeball looking back at me or something like that. I knew where it was, though. That was the main thing. For the rest of the fourth day, I used a small sand shovel to dig out the back of the cellar. Even though the weather outside was stormy and the digging left me sweaty and thirsty in the sweltering Kansas heat. The work was hard, especially with my limited equipment. Most of what I dug up was just dirt, however, there were bits of rubble from what I assume were parts of the wall that had caved in. Despite the mud from the leaky ceiling and my shovel breaking, I eventually managed to dig out the back side of the cellar by 6 p.m. Now I just had to figure out a way to distract the creature and get me and Sam into my neighbor's cellar without being found. I spent the next hour and a half setting up and gathering the materials for my plans. I gave Sam some dinner, I made myself... Some minute noodles in 59 seconds. I was in a rush. My plan? As quietly as I could. I replaced the boards between the cellar door with an old bit of wood that I dug up that was weak in the center. I attached a bit of survival rope to it. I, I tied a loop around the weakest point and then and I packed my backpack with a bit of food, water, and batteries. On top of all that, I packed in Sam. Luckily, she was quite small. Then with the rope in one hand and my knife in the other, I made my way over to the recently evacuated outside door and I prepared to make a run for it. All right, come on in, I screamed at the top of my lungs and before swinging the outside cellar door open and without looking back, I made a run for it. I sprinted across the dry grass of my yard and leapt over the poorly maintained hedges of my neighbors before banging on their cellar door and screaming for them to let me in. Mrs. Robinson opened the door and ushered me inside. Come in, come in, you're already drenched and just standing up there. I jumped down into the cellar and was shocked to find that there was no light. It was almost pitch black inside. Oh, Alec, you finally arrived, Mr. Robinson said. Always glad to see his visitors. Sorry, it's a bit dark. Our generator died an hour ago. Oh, it's fine, really. Better than being out of food, I replied. Just glad to be away from that thing. Yeah, I bet. Anyway, when was the last time you saw your brother, Mark? What? Uh, uh, what, what do you mean? Oh, he, he popped by a moment ago. He was looking. He uh, was wondering where you were. I started to sweat. My adrenaline up and pumping again after a brief calm period. Is he... Is he here? Hello? Ella? First off, thank you to everyone that commented with useful ideas on how to resolve my little dilemma. I'm touched by the willingness of strangers to help someone who may someday murder their grandpa. Secondly, I took some of your advice and proceeded to make the situation far, far worse. No, I did not jumpstart the zombie apocalypse. 
we're still good in that respect. If you're curious, I made my fortune through interest. Small investments stack up over 139 years, and perhaps I could have made even more money if I'd been aggressive, but I didn't want to attract attention. There's a level at which additional wealth simply becomes obscenity. I think mistakes accrue interest as well, and after a lifetime of careful, deliberate caution, I'm reaping my misfortune in full. To begin with, I found myself an accomplice. He's dead now. Uh, not by my hand. I think he half expected that I would be the one to kill him. I did too. Honestly, though, there, near the end, I was reconsidering and thinking that perhaps this would all work out. That he could go his way with what he wanted, and I can go my way, and we'd both bury this chapter of our lives to pretend like we never met. Sadly, he took my secrets to his grave, and I'm left with the image of his face when I found him dead, burned into my memories. A sorrowful, accepting gaze, permitting. His cloudy eyes widen only slightly with the pain of betrayal, and that last flicker of injustice from life being taken. He allowed himself to die. I think that is what I find most infuriating about this. He should have known that something had gone wrong and fought for his life, but he didn't. Perhaps that's why I had lived for so long and others hadn't. I know when to fight, I know when to flee, and I know better than to let moral attachments cloud my judgment. Call me a psychopath if you want. I've certainly wondered the same. I searched hard for this man. I scoured the internet, news archives, and court records. They were a handful of false starts, easily concealed under the guise of a different sort of inquiry the sort that would not be given any special consideration by the person in question. Finally, I found the sort of individual I was looking for. A divorced, disgraced, and disbarred lawyer. Ten years clean from the drugs that had left him in a haze while his three-year-old son drowned in the backyard swimming pool. I suppose my reasons for selecting such an individual are obvious. But after Jonah, and this is not his real name, sat there and quietly died without a struggle, I'm reminded that perhaps people aren't as intelligent as I assume, and so I feel compelled to enumerate them. Jonah was a man waiting to die. He'd made no attempt to recover his career and worked as a simple laborer, not even pursuing a management position as he likely could have easily obtained. He'd attained support groups only to break his drug habit and had never sought counseling for the death of his son. The divorce was uncontested. She took everything. I spoke with her as well, during a chance encounter that she thought was simply between stranger at a coffee shop, but I did what someone suggested, and after my hours with YouTube and a pile of makeup products, I came out looking like uh, I was at least a teenager. <laughs> then I waited at this woman's favorite coffee shop, got in line behind her, and pretended to cry. <laughs> Told her that my parents were getting divorced, my mom had a lawyer, and was being really mean to my dad, and in her attempt to console me, she told me her story. And in it was everything I needed to know. That she felt he was punishing himself. That she had taken the house, the cars, and everything else in a fit of anger, thinking there'd be a fight for it. And then she could truly hate him for the drugs, for the death. But he'd just signed. And that was that. And now, she pitied him. She didn't know how that would help my situation. She wasn't sure why she was telling me at all. And she laughed nervously, apologizing. And I told her it was fine. That it did help me feel better about my parents. And uh, I felt much better after hearing her story. Some of that was true. <laughs> I did feel better. I knew Jonah would work. His life ended with his sons. He wouldn't care what happened to himself or others. All I had to do was offer him a glimmer of hope. I went to his house. I handed him my stack of both current and expired driver's license, both of my birth certificates, the original and the forgery, and I said, I am 139 years old and I think I can resurrect your son. Now, if you're already scrolling down to the comments to make a quip about toddler zombies, don't be crass. The genre ceases to be amusing when the dead are real and someone's mourning the lost. Now, I will kill and manipulate and lie to maintain my life, but... I have not yet forgotten the gravity of my action. I am strong enough to carry the weight, but I still feel it on my shoulders. Besides, I think we wound up with something far worse than a zombie. He was skeptical. But he allowed me inside while he checked my documents. I believe he was initially trying to decide where I obtained them, and perhaps if he should call the police to return them to whoever was my guardian. 
I sat on a ratty sofa while he laid out the plastic cards in sequence, periodically glancing up to compare my current face with the one displayed in the photo. I saw him considering, checking, rechecking dates until he finally leaned back and stared at me with naked suspicion. These all belong to the same person, he finally said. The rest went unstated. Same person. But the timeline was not linear. My appearance jumped around in time. Sometimes 40, sometimes 20, now 12. I waited with my hands clasped primly in my lap. He got out an underpowered laptop and began to look things up. Someone on my last post asked who I voted for in the 1912's presidential election. He asked that as well, along with other things. The obvious questions. Did I participate in suffrage marches? I did. What I did during the World Wars. How I survived the Great Depression. I had a sum of money by then that wasn't invested in stocks, and I lived comfortably off that. Did I go to the first Woodstock? No. Much to my regret. More challenging questions. Did I read Dracula when it was published? And what did I think? I did. And perhaps it was my inspiration to live forever. I was 17 at the time. Uh, did I go to speakeasies? Rarely. And only when I was convinced it was safe. I have always been cautious. Uh, what was it like during the Cold War? Uneasy? I was afraid my false identities would be uncovered and assumed to be a front for a Russian spy. Finally, he was forced to concede that either I was what I claimed, or this was a superbly executed hoax. I mean, a bargain with him. We'd find someone with only a few years to spare, and I would give them to him. Proof. And to see if I could use my methods on a third party, although I did not tell him, he was to be an experiment. It all went as planned. And when we returned to his house, and he stood there in front of his bathroom mirror, marveling at how the lines at the corners of his eyes were smoothed out, I knew that he was mine. He spent that evening making my arrangements for a prolonged absence. I notified my boss at work that my family affairs were complicated, and I would need an extended leave, and I was willing to take an unpaid time off. He drove me to my house and introduced himself to the neighbors as a house sitter while I was away. Gathered up some of my belongings so that I wouldn't have to return, as it was risky for me to leave, even in my car. As I feared being seen by a neighbor in those few minutes, my car was pulling into the driveway and waiting for the garage door to close behind me. And then I set to work. Jonah would be my lab rat. I told him that what we were attempting was dangerous, and if I erred, I could give away all his lifetime left. He made me a promise that if he died, I would keep working on perfecting the process and continue to resurrect his son. I made contact with my sources for forged documents and requested two birth certificates, one that listed Jonah and his ex-wife as the child's parents, and the other listed me. I suppose that's why I feel responsible for the current situation. I've never married, nor had any interest in starting a family, but I intended to follow through on my promise. Jonah's dead now, and his son remains. It's fitting, I suppose. I made the boy what he is, and I'm now his parent on more than paper. We tried first on one of Jonah's fellow laborers. Jonah brought him home for some drinks, slipped something into his beer, and we experimented on him while he slept. Gave some of Jonah's lifespan to him, for Jonah was uncomfortable with keeping his stolen years. I picked him carefully, moral enough not to betray me, but despised himself enough to do things he found repulsive. What's a little more hatred on his back, after finding his son's bloated body face down in the pool? My process worked. I still don't know how to transfer a finite amount of time, but I devised a way to safely interrupt the ritual. In theory, I told Jonah. He could break free after only a second and keep from draining himself of all life that way. Took an act of will, Jonah said when he recovered from the ordeal. He felt like he was spiraling off into the darkness, and he thought, thought of the drugs and how he'd let himself slip away under them, and those memories gave him the strength to claw back from the edge. Otherwise, he feared he'd given all his life away to his unconscious friend. We celebrated our victory, and Jonah let his co-workers sleep the alcohol off on his sofa while he went to the cemetery for a bit of a grave robbing. We were lucky. The child's body was small, less to dig up, less disturbed earth to conceal, less to transport. I gave the boy roughly ten years. The process is inexact. I made it as if he had never died. 
Juno wept over him while I lay on the floor sobbing in pain, having my lifetime ripped from me. I had no idea it hurt like this. It felt like dying. Like I was unwinding inside, and the only thing that kept me from stopping the process too soon was remembering my first failed attempt, thinking of all that lifespan I'd accumulated being spent as energy and rending my body into red mist. Then I pulled myself back from the edge. Once the boy's body was suitably restored, drawing that thread back inside myself and cutting it free, Jonah doted over his son for the next five days, washing him, dressing him, fed him. The boy was listless, barely responding to stimuli, and his responses were delayed, and I ran him through some neurological checks. Brain damage, I thought to myself. Jonah just thought that he was still a toddler in his head, that he'd missed out on all those years of development. He'd catch up over time, and everything would be normal someday. The child did not act like a toddler. He was vacant, hollow. I found him staring at the wall in the hallway at one point, just Standing perfectly still, eyes almost unblinking, spine rigid, his gaze fixed straight ahead. I called his name, and he didn't respond. I walked over and I touched his shoulder, and after a minute he turned his head, just his head, staring at me with that flat stare, and I backed away in unease. He was still staring at where I'd been standing, well after I had retreated to the other room. I confess, I was unsurprised that the child had come back nearly brain-dead, Reversing someone's physical aging is quite different than reversing decay. However, I needed an accomplice that was desperate, and a dead child engenders the sort of reckless disregard for consequences I wanted. Besides, I reasoned, the result would become someone else's problem and I could go on my way. As I said before, my mistakes have seen their day, and they'll lie waiting for me no longer. I went to check on Jonah two days after the resurrection. I had resolved to keep in contact with him for as long as it took to sell my house, for I felt it was time for an identity shift so as to bury all this behind me. To ensure that he kept his silence, he didn't answer the door, so I let myself in with a spare key that I made without his knowledge while he was out at his day job. There was a sickly sweet smell in the air, not like a day rot. I found Jonah in the living room, sitting on his chair in front of the TV. He was old, perhaps in his seventies, with wispy white hair and fine wrinkles along the loose skin on his hands. I prowled through the house, listening intently, straining to hear anything other than my own footsteps. Nothing. The boy was gone. Now in my mind, I could see how it went. The boy walked up to Jonah, that empty expression on his face, raising a hand to caress his father's cheek. And Jonah, blind to reality with his desperate hope, thinking that this had to be his son, that it couldn't be anything else, that it couldn't be some hollow, empty shell that I'd raised, absent of whatever spark of life makes us who we are inside. Damn him. Should have done something, should have fought back, should have killed that thing. I asked too much. Jonah saw his dead son once again, impossible to see it through a second time. Turned the gas stove on and lit a candle in another room in the house. Jonah's body was burned beyond recognition when they finally got the fire under control. Yesterday I saw the local news that another body has been found, an unidentified man, perhaps 60 years old. There was also a missing persons report filed the same day, a 33-year-old man. I went to the police and said that I'd seen someone out jogging and perhaps it was him, and they gave me the description of what he was wearing and I told him it didn't match what I'd seen and left. Then I went to the morgue, said my grandpa was at home and wasn't answering his cell phone, and I'd seen the news and maybe I could see the body because I was so scared it was him. He was wearing the same clothes as the missing jogger. You know what I should have done? Find a different way to secure assistance and obtain people to experiment on and then parceled my life away in bits and pieces. I could have volunteered at a nursing home, bled my years away one at a time that way. That would have been the smart way to do things, but I wanted someone I could control. And I got Jonah and then I felt obligated to see our bargain through. I was arrogant. Too confident in my own cleverness, believing myself immune from the consequences. I believe the boy is a vortex. The equation's not balanced, can't be balanced. The grave is a gaping void that consumes and consumes and can't be sated. My math works only so long as it remains on this side of the veil, but now I've reached over. The rules have changed. It's my mistake. 
Now I gotta fix it. If only to keep people from realizing that a lifespan is not immutable. In the meantime, if you see a boy or a man with vacant eyes approaching you, don't let him touch you. That's how my process starts. And you will not survive it. Hey there. Just thought I'd share a couple spooky stories from my childhood to get everyone all hyped for Halloween. So when I was a child, it was just me and my mother. We lived in a property owned by my grandmother. Three-story old farmhouse right at the fringe of the woods. It was far off the road. Then a long, unlit, gravel driveway. Felt very isolated at night, being so distant from any other houses. Set in an area that hadn't been inhabited for 30 years before we started living in it. Quite often, I was a fairly rambunctious child, so when my mother went off to work, I would occasionally skip the morning bus to school and stay at home alone all day. Big house had a habit of feeling incredibly lonely and sparse. So I spent most of my time playing in the forest expanse out back, some distance into the woods far enough that I I couldn't hear, couldn't hear my mother while she was called. There was a toppled pine tree which had crashed into another and even larger trunk on its way down it was now frozen there, forming a long arc over the forest floor. I love to climb up the jagged stump at the base of this fallen tree and then steady myself to a point just above the middle. Never able to make it all the way to the top because it just got too steep for me to continue any further. A bad habit of freaking out from how high up I was. And one day, I was sitting in my usual spot in the fallen tree, which is a good distance from the ground, just listening to the birds singing and simultaneously feeling the warmth of the sun on my neck, when I heard something strange underneath that paralyzed me. Hey, kid. I was gripped by a sudden strong urge of fear for a moment. The voice had come from directly underneath me. I strained to look, but I couldn't see anything over the ledge. For a long time, I sat there in absolute silence, and I was at the point where I was almost soon to convince myself that I had imagined hearing a man's voice at all. I know you can hear me. His voice was much louder this time. As I yelled something out and scrambled up the log a bit higher, trembling nervously, I dug my fingers into the bark and held tight for dear life. I sat there trying to collect my nerves for God knows how long, although I couldn't see it, the presence of the thing underneath me was still clear. The bird song was much softer and more cautious this time, and when I listened closely, I swear I could hear the faintest echo of human breathing. Gathering all my courage, I vowed to prove to myself that it was all my imagination by leaning over the ledge as far as possible without slipping right off. Digging hard into the bark behind me, I stretched out along my arms and peered over, getting a full view of the empty forest floor and undergrowth. When suddenly, come down here or I'll come up and grab you. It was so loud. It was, it was as if I was being screamed right in my face. I released my grip onto the tree in fright and plunged off the platform. I was saved only by grabbing a nearby branch. And for one awful second, my bare legs dangled in the cool air. When I pulled myself up, I ran at full speed to the top of the collapsed pine to the point I had never reached before. I sat there just below the rustling canopy, pissing myself and staring at the distant base where the splintered wood rose, fully expecting at any moment to see someone crawling rapidly up the pine towards me. Instead, all I heard was the wind whistling in the leaves above me and below me and occasionally snippets of birdsong. It was about two hours before my mother got home, found me after much worried searching, trembling, crying at the top of the fallen tree. Now, although this incident spooked both me and my mother in time, I somehow recovered, exhibiting that naive hard skin of a child, although I, I never went as far into the forest as I used to, and never again even approached that fallen tree. And once when I was 12, I had a chore of taking firewood from the shed out back, just at the edge of the woods, and to bring it back inside the house. It was a tiresome job, and I always chose to do it at dusk when the air was brimming with mosquitoes and a swampy fog that usually coated the lawn, but by the time I had made my last round, I would sprint back to the house, spooked. One of my least favorite things about this job was that 
The shed was full of barn owls. Now, have you ever seen a barn owl's face staring at you from a dark roof corner? Then you know how uncomfortable that shed made me. One of these nights got mistier than it had ever been before. Thick silver fog covered everything, and limited my line of sight to a short sphere around me. Even though the shed wasn't far from the house, I found myself feeling disoriented, and more than once I walked in the wrong direction. Both times, for some reason, walking straight into the woods. By the time I had reached my last load, it was too foggy to see the street. My eyes stung in the moisture, and it made my visions blur. Lurching forward, I managed to walk headfirst into a tree, doubling over and dropping all the wood I was bundling onto my feet with a hard crunch. As I went to pick them up, with my foot throbbing pretty hard, I realized that the ground was too misty for me to see my own knees. I decided to head to the house, since we had more than enough wood for one night. However, it was getting to be pretty dark, and I couldn't make out any signifiers of which direction I was heading in, even though I cautiously walked for several feet in all directions, trying to figure out my position in the mist. I still couldn't figure out any point of identification. I couldn't even locate the fence or the gate. The more I walked, the more I seemed to stumble into trees, pine needles, mud crunched under my feet, instead of a dew-covered lawn. After a while, I finally realized that I couldn't even find the shed anymore. While cursing myself for being so dumb, while trying to ignore my thumping heart and sense that somehow something else was at play, I became aware that I was lost somewhere in the fringe of the forest. Screaming out for my mother at the loudest possible volume was only met with a resounding silence from the depths of the mist all around from where I stood, affirming that I had wandered too far from the house to be heard as a deep panic started to settle on me, I noticed a glimpse of something pink moving against a nearby pine trunk. Coming closer, I saw that it was a ripped-out square of pink paper. On it, there was an arrow pointing left. It looks vaguely like something my mom might make. I rationalized to keep me from getting lost, so foolishly, I followed the direction set by that green arrow, shivering in the increasing cold. I kept walking for about five to ten minutes before needing to stop to take a breath. My heart was pounding so fast, it was beginning to hurt. As I was sitting down, however, I spied what appeared to be another note fluttering on a nearby trunk. I noticed that this one was embedded with a long nail. It bore another arrow, this one pointing up, and a small, sloppy written note that said, This way. Despite my increasing panic, I convinced myself that these notes were my only shot at getting back before nightfall. I was desperate to get the hell out, and my brow was cold with sweat. So I followed the green arrow to a point where I could just dimly make out another spot of pink up an incline of collapsed stumps leaf litter. At this point, it was getting pretty dark, and I had to strain both my eyes just to see a few meters ahead of me. Following the green arrows, feeling less and less sure of where I was, I stumbled through the woods, groping out in the mist to feel for trees, although I was terrified of something unseen grabbing my arm. I came across the third green note that had another arrow pointing up again, this one leading to an increasingly steep slope that I didn't recognize being anywhere near my house, and with a poorly drawn smiley face right above it. At this stage, I became too freaked out to cope and started to cry as I slumped against the pine tree. The possibility that I would be out in these woods all night was beginning to sink in like a, like a syringe being driven into the veins within my arm. I caught a glimpse of another pink square in the near distance, and squinting hard, unnerved by these notes, all of which looked fresh without any sign of decay despite the previous week's non-stop rain. I read it from afar. What I read made my blood turn cold. I stood to my knees, dead silently, wobbling on them in fear. My ears were sensitive to any tiny prickle of noise in the mist. For a long time I stood there in the rolling fog, reading and rereading that horrible note over and over again before a snapping stick somewhere behind me caused me to sprint blindly, twigs snagging at my ankles and cutting at my face as I ran. Written on that note in, in big green letters was my name. Felt like I was running for hours, all the while the rain and mist lapped at the back of my neck like the decaying breath of someone running right behind me. Somehow I made it back to the house. All the lights were off and I struggled to find the keys for a moment. When I found them, I bolted indoors and finally crawled into bed where I remained, unsleeping till morning. 
Mom just thought I'd come inside and gone to bed and hadn't thought to leave the lights on. It was a miracle, or some freakish coincidence, that I even found the house at all. The final incident at that damn house was witnessed only by my mother. Up until then, she had never experienced any of the strange things as I had, although we mutually shared the particularly oppressive quality that the house interior had upon us and its placement in the dreary, imposing woods. Although I was obviously never a popular kid, by living way out in the country, in the opposite direction from everyone else in my school, I did make some tight friends in my first year of high school. One of these friends, Amanda was her name, invited me over one night, and I accepted. My mother drove me out to the place, which was about three miles away, and then drove back home. The night went well. We watched a horror movie, suitably, devoured some pizza, probably smoked pot. My mother went home alone, where she intended to get some writing done. She worked for a magazine at that point. It was about midnight when I received an off-putting text from my mom in all caps. Is this a prank? I need to know immediately. Thinking of some joke, I texted back, Calm yourself. Is what a prank? Almost immediately, the response, Are you out of the house? Of course, I responded, No. Though I was thoroughly weirded out, I didn't receive another message until around 3 a.m., when she told me to go to my grandma's in the morning and to not, by any means, dare go home. I remember those bleak torrents of rain the day that I went to my grandma's and how terribly soaked I was when I finally got there. It was nearly two towns away. I'd had to fight the temptation to go home and drop off my bags, but mom's disturbing message from last night were enough to warn me not to do so. When I arrived, Mom and Grandma were having lunch. At first, my mother seemed to be in some sort of composed state, but when I got a better look at her, I noticed that all the color had been drained from her face. She was slightly trembling. At one point, she even sent a small glass crashing to the floor after flinching at the cat brushing against her ankles. It wasn't until later that night, when my grandma was sound asleep, that she told me what happened. She went further as to forbid me from telling old Grandma, out of fear that it would horrify her superstitious soul too much. This is what happened the night when I was at Amanda's. As she described in lurid detail, my mother was sitting on the first story of the living room, where she sat on the couch by the fire, curtains open to the view of the sunset in the canopy, going over her latest draft. At first it was so faint that she barely noticed it, but after a while my mother became aware of and vaguely irritated by tiny thumping noises near her head at the window. When she went over to investigate, she saw fat brown moths, a kind that we often got at that place, buzzing madly into the glass. Reasoning that this was the cause of the sound, she returned to her work. However, feeling rattled in some way, it was, it was when the noises started to get sharper and louder, she paid more attention and saw the rocks were being thrown at the window from the total blackness of the forest edge. She saw them appear from the shadows of the bush and then fall in an arc and bounce off the window. Looking carefully, she could see small cracks from where some heavy ones had hit, right beside where her head had been moments before. Temporarily captivated, she tried to peer into the darkness enough to make out where the rocks were being thrown from. And with a startled shock, she jumped back from the window as she saw me, standing half behind a tree right near the window, grinning wide and staring at her. My one visible eye stretched wide open, showing all the whiteness. She barely stifled a scream seeing her own daughter standing there, just staring and smiling. Not only did the figure not move or blink, it was standing by one of the nearest pines, far from where the rocks were shooting out from the bushes, as they continued to do so in a loud downpour. My face unceasingly continued to press out at her, smiling. Thinking this was all some kind of a sick prank, hence the later text, my mom shouted my name at the top of her lungs, frightened to the core. However, instead of responding, the mouth of the thing that looked like me behind the tree just started moving as if it were mouthing silent words really, really fast. And suddenly, it turned its head to the side and seemed to be talking to somebody else beside the tree. My mom said who she couldn't see, but, but she could see a formless black shape hanging against the other side of the tree. The thing that looked like me kept staring at my mother and doing the silent speed-talking thing, then, then turning and whispering to the thing next to it. Then it would turn back and start up again. Then breaking the monotonous spell, it suddenly pointed straight at my mother and started laughing. 
My mother screamed and fled to my bedroom on the second story, the only room with a working lock, where she shut herself in and sat at the far end of the bed as the rocks began to pitter-patter against the window downstairs, dry heaving and weeping in fear. In my room, my mother said she did not feel safe. There was an awful smell and a weird humming noise in the walls, as she described. She tried to pray for a time before giving up and just listening to the rocks pelt the walls and windows. Somewhere in the kitchen, she caught the distinct vibrating sound of a window actually smashing and the weird continuous hum. Listening more carefully, she could identify it as the softest hint of a mumbling voice. In absolute terror, she recognized the voice and then virtually, too afraid to look, she tilted her head up to the closet door where an awful white face could be seen staring at her, mouth contorting and gaping in what sounded like highly sped up whispers. Now, the closet door was only a meter from my mother. It started to open slowly. In an unimaginable explosion of terror, she immediately bolted to the door, only to fumble with the lock as bigger and bigger rocks came crashing through the windows, which burst apart the spray of glass shards, before finally getting out, running out of the house, completely keeping her eye off the woods, getting into her car and backing off. She said that as she glanced back, right at the end of the prolonged driveway, she saw two unmistakable human forms standing at my broken bedroom window, watching as her car got further and further away from her house. This would be the final farewell as my mother never stepped foot in that place again. As my mother told this story, she broke down into tears. I didn't doubt her, and I still don't. I honestly and fully believe that she experienced what she said. It was also quite clear that we were done living in that house once and for all. I only went back once, with my dad, who I see very rarely now. But he came from another state to help us move. Mom had already found a place in town and moved in. My dad and I just loaded up his truck with all that was left inside there. It was a silent, sunny morning when we removed all the stuff and emptied the place. I wish I could say there was some closure, some final spooking to cap it all off, but there wasn't. Just a relief to get out of there. There was, however, only two things left worth mentioning. Number one, when we checked the house for any signs of intruders, we found that several windows, including one in the bedroom and the kitchen, had been smashed and rocks were lying on the floor. Number two, Dad went out into the trees for a bit to uh, take a leak. When he came back, he asked how long we'd had the swing set for. Now, needless to say, we'd never had a swing set, so I was fairly unsettled to discover that in the week since we'd been gone, someone had assembled a rope swing set from one of the highest branches of the old pine over the ridge, against which had this fallen log that I'd stopped climbing many years ago. There was obviously a new rope, and a nicely polished, sanded down wooden seat at the base. Dad wanted to keep my mind from recent events. He doubted the affair and thought my mother was mentally unstable. He said that a um, neighbor probably set it up, not realizing it was on our property. Of course, he knew as well as I did that we had literally no neighbors for at least a mile in any direction. There were no houses in all that space, and never in my time living there did I ever see another sign of human habitation, but I let it all go. I was pleased enough just to say good riddance to that horrible place as we drove off for good. For the most part, I found it best to try and forget what happened in that place. Sometimes, I just can't help but ponder it, though. It's been, it's been long enough now that I no longer feel scared talking about it, but for a long while... I couldn't. And seeing as it's Halloween, what better time is it to share? My grandmother just recently sold the house to a new family. That being a young couple and their little son shortly after he moved out, despite my mother's desperate insistence that it be left empty. Now she refuses to talk about what happened altogether. I'm less anxious about it, although sometimes I can't help but let my imagination get the better of me. All I can do is think of that old house, the fallen down tree, the new occupants, and the swing out back, gently spinning in the breeze, as that boy toddles, obviously, towards it. My name's Albert, and I'll tell you. 
I'm a simple farmer, but I grow the best darn vegetables. People call from all over to buy my produce. It's much better than anything you can get in the store. And now that we're getting into fall weather, I made this corn maze that everyone really loves. People get lost in there for hours. I like to give back to my community, though. I heard that they've been having some weird weather over in Myersville. Nothing can get in or out lately, including fresh produce. So I loaded up my old truck to take some over. She's rusty. Had her forever, but she ain't never broke down on me yet. Call her old reliable. Driving through the town was one of the creepiest things I ever saw. Not a single person came out to my truck. They all just sat on their porches and watched me. It was real creepy. Every pair of eyes watched me as I drove through town. No kids outside playing, no one else walking down the street or driving. The entire town was all just a bunch that sat on their porches. The creepiest part? They all looked melted, too. Half their faces hanging down off their skulls looked like some some kid tried to sculpt the whole town out of Play-Doh. It's had a shiver right up my spine. Thought about bringing my son Melvin with me, but um, it probably would have scared the pants right off him. If he wore pants. So I turned around and drove on home. I didn't sell anything, but that's all right. Sure, somebody will buy him right out when I come to open up that corn maze. It's almost done. And I tell you, Melvin sure loves running around in that thing. Stays in there for hours sometimes. And I don't worry about him, though. He's a silly boy. He's all right. I made him myself. I asked the missus for help, but she told me it wasn't right. He probably would have turned out better than the missus had stuck around, but it was a small uh, mishap. Anyway, he's a little twiggish. Mostly because he's made out of twigs and vines and stuff, but he's got this big head like a Venus flytrap. See, this weird fella came rolling through saw my farm. Stopped and said hi. Said I uh, had some of the best produce he ever saw. Said uh, he could sell me something to help him grow better. I thought it sounded like a load of nonsense, but the missus said that we should give him a chance. She was also so kind and generous, that's why I married her. Hope she'd passed all that on to Melvin in a short time together. Anyway, this weird little guy said that if we bought his fertilizer recipe, well, he'd throw in some rare seeds, too. Said that uh, we'd have to fertilize it according to his recipe, though, but it was a guaranteed success. The missus was on board with it until she found out what goes into the fertilizer. As weird as that guy was, he was certainly onto something. Said it was gonna double, maybe even triple my profits, and by golly, he was right. He didn't leave any contact information. I would have passed it on to somebody, uh, some one of the other local businesses around here. So anyway, I planted those seeds and followed the instructions. All the seeds died except one. I named him Melvin because that sounded like a smart name. Mrs. Fainted when she met Melvin. Yeah, she was just too overcome with happiness. I know I was. And Melvin's real smart, too. He still get in the hang of talk, and he mostly just squeaks and chirps, but I can usually understand him. I'm trying to get him to help me finish up the corn maze. He sure loves testing it out. It's almost done, though. If I can push through the night, I can probably finish it tomorrow morning and open it up for business. I know people sure do love the pumpkin spice stuff. When the morning came, I set up some signs advertising produce, hot chocolate, and corn maze. Though I thought it was still a little too warm for hot chocolate. People still buy the stuff anyway. Well, I asked Melvin for help cleaning up a bit. He just did his weird little high-pitched giggle and ran off the corn maze. Surprisingly, people started arriving during the afternoon. I think it was a little too bright outside for people to do the corn maze, so most of them just bought produce. I sell a lot of corn, uh, a lot of tomatoes. Probably would have sold some more pumpkins, but they're not quite ready yet. A few people asked what the trick was to get such big vegetables packed with so much flavor. I just told them it was a trade secret. And when night started to fall, the most obnoxious group of kids showed up. Bunch of them. Uh, those, uh, what do kids call them? Meatheads? Jocks? They had some real pretty girls with them, too. But one of them was dressed in real tiny shorts, and she had the prettiest hair I'd ever seen. Mrs. always yelled at me for staring at the young women, but I couldn't help myself. I know they dress like this on purpose. Uh, her meathead friends were busy fooling around and punching each other, and I could smell alcohol on them. Told her that she might get cold later, dressed like that, but she just sneered at me. I know it's all just an act, though. Women dress all revealing like that on purpose and then feign repulsion when a fellow like me shows an interest in them. They squeal about it with their friends, but secretly, they like the attention. Sure enough, when the sun set and the air started to cool, she started complaining she was cold and she wanted to go home. Her friends are too busy still fooling around, though. They had another friend with them, but she wasn't nearly as pretty as this one. She was just, you know, all right to look at. She suggested they go get some hot chocolate. After I handed them cups, I saw them walking away and added something else to the cocoa from the flask. 
guess that worked. Cause soon after, she stopped complaining, and the two of them were dancing along to music. The one girl danced like a spastic fish out of water, but the pretty one? Hmm. She sure knew how to twist and move. I got a real nice view of her. Hey, y'all should try the corn maze, called over to him. She just scoffed, but the meatheads got really into the idea. Yeah, let's do it, they cheered, falling over each other. Is it even any good? I mean, this place is kind of a dump, she said. She was clearly trying to play the not interested game. Now, the missus had tried that when I first tried talking her out, but see how that worked out for her. Well, sure, I said, coolly as I could. There's people still in there. It's a lot warmer. Corn's a good insulator. I winked at her. They paid up. They headed inside. It wasn't long before we started hearing shrieks and giggles from the maze. I switched the radio to play some music from a Halloween disc I bought a few years ago. The sounds from the corn maze blended right in with the music. I started hearing Melvin's giggles, followed by some screaming, and I, I frowned because Melvin wasn't supposed to be in the maze when we had customers, and I headed inside. The air was cool. As a crisp breeze whispered through the rows and rows of corn, the dirt ground crunched beneath my boots. All was eerily silent except for the muffled music, the occasional rustle in the corn. To the untrained person, the maze can be a real labyrinth, but since I'm the one who made it, I knew that thing like the back of my hand. I was surprised to see Melvin had done some decorating, though. Turned left, right, right, left, until I came into an intersection with a path split in every direction. Now, at one dead end, he had managed to move one of my scarecrows, fit its head with an old rusty bear trap that lay around. At another dead end was a string of little makeshift straw dolls. That boy was so creative. I was so proud of them. Then you know him. When the ground under my feet started squishing and squelching, I knew something wasn't right. Followed the squishy path to the specifically long and winding dead end. At the end, Melvin had placed a couple of hay bales in case anyone needed to stop and take a rest. The boy was so darn considerate. And sure enough, one of the meatheads had stopped and take a load off. Except in the dim light, I could see he was, he was slick with blood. His guts spilled out into his lap. All his teeth had been pulled out and scattered around him. At the very least, he would have made a convincing decoration for the time being. I headed deeper into the maze. Right, left, straight, left. I had really outdone myself this year with the maze. There were plenty of dead turns for people to get stuck. A few people who had made it through had told me that it was one of the most difficult mazes they had ever been through. The next dead end I found ended abruptly. A deep trench had been dug and several fence posts had been sharpened and stuck in the ground. The last pretty girl was impaled up on those posts. The sharp end poking right through her stomach. Her face was frozen with horror. Her, her eyes wide, her mouth open, and a scream of blood just trickled out. Melvin! I called out. Where are you, boy? But he didn't answer. Instead, a sharp scream cut through the eerie night, and I followed it until I found the pretty girl and the other meathead. Deep lacerations covered his body, and blood pooled underneath him. The girl was on the ground next to him, breathing heavy. Her eyes were wide with fear. Help me, she screamed at me. She sure was in a pretty bad shape. One of her feet was cut almost clean off. Long legs were stained with blood and bite marks. What's all this here? I asked. What kind of sick freak show are you putting on here? She yelled at me. I didn't answer, but her rustling in the corn next to her caused her to gasp. She started to drag her body away from it, her foot dragging behind her, limp and useless. Melvin emerged from the corn, chittering and chirping like he always does. Melvin, what have you gotten yourself into, boy? I asked him. He just looked at me, he cocked his head to the side, he opened his mouth with a makeshift smile, revealing a row of sharp teeth, and his mouth dripped blood and pieces of flesh were stuck in his teeth. He squealed, and he took another step towards the girl. The rest of the viney body was also stained with blood. I bet you wanted to help your old man, eh? I asked him. The girl lay between us, looking back and forth, unsure of what to do. Melvin chirped again, and I grinned at him. All right, now, let's get you out of here, I said to the girl as I picked her up and slung her over my shoulder. Thank you, thank you so much, she gushed. I guess this is what it looks like. I guess this is what it took to get a pretty girl to be nice to you. Wait, where are you going? I moved closer to the corn maze. She started to hit and kick me with a good foot. Nestled right at the edge of the cornfield was my old work shed. I kept a bunch of old rusty tools up in there. Some seeds and some other equipment. I pulled a key out of my pocket and unlocked the door. Inside it was rank and unpleasant, but you got used to it after a while. Melvin trotted in behind me, eager to help. Hey, what are you doing? Where are we? The girl shrieked, starting to hit at me again, and I flung her down on a work table, probably harder than I should have. And she whimpered when she landed, and she scrambled to get away from Melvin when he ran up to look at her. He snapped and growled at her. The hell is that? She asked, pointing at something behind me. I turned to see what she was pointing at. Oh, 
Well, that's the missus. She likes to watch me work. She was referencing a severely uh, rotted, severed head that sat on top of a tool chest in the corner of the shed. I admit it was pretty nasty, but I could, couldn't bring myself to get rid of it. I like looking at her every day. Now, let's get to work, I said, pulling out a small hatchet. Now, the bodies tonight, well, they'd help fertilize my crops for months. I was nine years old the first time I saw the columns. I remember waking up and noticing that the morning sunlight wasn't stabbing its way through my childhood bedroom blinds. Overcast, I thought. So I went downstairs for breakfast. My parents were already there, which was normal. But my father was wearing something that looked like a cross between a formal tuxedo and a surgical gown. That was not normal. What's that for? I asked. My parents shared a long gaze. And my father turned back to me. Have you seen them? Have you looked outside? I had no idea what he was talking about. What well, was them? Who talks about the weather like that? I was nine. I didn't really understand how strange that phrase was until I was older. No, I said, as I bounced out of my chair and walked over to the window. A street looked like the normal suburban street it was just with less morning sunlight than normal. I looked up to the clouds, and even at nine years old, my stomach shot straight up to my throat. I didn't know exactly what I was seeing, but I knew it was impossible. And I knew I should be deeply afraid of whatever could be doing something like that. Rising up above the roof lines and trees, my extremely average, extremely flat Midwestern town, were gigantic, gray columns. They stretched so high, the top of the window cut off my view. I had no idea where they stopped. What the hell are those? I asked, trying to maintain my balance. Language, my mother interjected, worrying about something as mundane as my evolving vocabulary at a time like that only made the incredibly bizarre scene outside even stranger by contrast. Okay, but what's going on? I asked. I looked back at my dad and his weird outfit, uniform, costume. Even now I can't find the best words to describe it. There was something ritualistic about it, like, like it had been designed long ago, worn by many people, passed down through time. Those are the columns, my dad said matter-of-factly, as if it wasn't the most obvious thing in the world. They come up sometime, just means there's something that needs doing. It's nothing to worry about. Where? Like, why? Where do they come from? And what needs doing? I asked, even more confused now. My parents' apparent comfort with the columns was incredibly disturbing. They're nothing to be afraid of, honey. Put some shoes on. We can go see one. My mother smiled at me, as if she could make me feel any better in that moment. And maybe she could. I don't know. I went and I put on my shoes. What about school? I asked, as we walked out to the sidewalk. My mom laughed. There won't be any school today. Just enjoy the day off. Where did they come from? I asked again, getting frustrated with not being told anything that answered any of the dozens of questions that were flying through my head. Well, the ground, I think. You'll see. My mom smiled warmly at me, like she was teaching me some new word or science fact. You think? You usually know everything, of everything that was happening that morning. It feels impossible now, but I think the most unsettling thing of all was that in that moment, I realized my mom barely knew more about the columns than I did. But she was comfortable with them. She was clearly accustomed to their presence, somehow. But she didn't know them. We walked for about a block before coming to one. It towered over the town, its height matched only by the other columns spread about it. I quickly noticed that they were laid out in a perfect grid pattern. Every few hundred feet, or another column rose up towards the sky. With nothing to compare them to except for each other, the tallest building in town was a four-story days inn that had been built the year before. 
I couldn't even begin to estimate how tall they were. They didn't extend forever, I could see that much, but they reached up incredibly high. Maybe to the clouds. I don't know. They're cement, I said. Concrete, my mother corrected. Cement is an ingredient in concrete. These are concrete. So, someone must have built them. Concrete is used to build things. My nine-year-old mind was working so hard to understand what I was seeing, I walked up to the column and placed my hand against it. It wasn't until that moment that the magnitude of what I was looking at really set in. The column was so high, far too high for me to even guess at. But it was wide, too, not the width of an average single-family house. The four sides reaching skyward appeared to be the exact same width, and as far as I could tell, looking off into the distance, all the columns seemed to be the exact same size and shape. Dozens of them, maybe hundreds. To this day, I can't say. Enough that, even spaced out as they were, they could block out the sun. Maybe someone did. Maybe not, my mother said. A hint of mystery in that second part. So, you really don't know where they came from? I tried one last time. My mother laughed. No, I really don't. Does Dad... Your father knows more than I do. He doesn't know everything, but some. He'll tell you when you're older. That didn't satisfy me at all. I wanted to know then and there. As we started walking back to my house, the tiniest part of my brain recognized something that was so impossible to explain, even compared to the columns themselves, that it didn't make itself known as a conscious thought until weeks later. And even then, I never voiced it out loud. I never brought it up. I never asked where the space for the columns came from, because it was abundantly clear that the town itself had been shifted in space, buildings and ground and trees and the distances between them, all moved to accommodate the sudden appearance of the columns. I know this seems impossible. This all does. When we got back home, my father was still wearing that strange outfit. Somehow, both faded and shiny looking. He was collecting a suitcase that I'd never seen before from my parents' bedroom. My parents shared another long, silent stare. I'm gonna have to go in now, my dad said, more to my mom than to me. I know, she said. I'm not positive, but I think I heard her choke on the words for a split second. You'll be home tonight, though, right? Of course he'd be home that night. Dad worked in the municipal building just a couple miles away. He came home every day after work. Why wouldn't he be home tonight? I asked. My parents both looked at me, uncertainty in their eyes. I couldn't tell if it was because they didn't know why he might not be home or something else. Then my overloaded brain finally caught up with the conversation. I added, is it because of the columns? Dad opened his mouth to answer, but then stopped. After a moment, he started again. Yeah, it's because of the columns. Part of my job is to take care of them when they show up, and sometimes it can take a while. I was confused. You work in an office. You do paperwork. What do you do when the columns show up? It's a different part of my job. I just... Someone has to go into a special part of the municipal building, and that person is me. It's... He trailed off clearly unsure of how to explain this to me. It's specialized work that I was trained to do when I first started there, years ago. So when the columns appear, I'm the one who goes. I nodded, completely confused and honestly understanding the situation less than I did before. My dad, who helped manage the town's buildings, also went to some special part of what looked like a very boring building and did something whenever the columns showed up which clearly wasn't often because I was nine, and this was the first time I ever remember seeing them. Where do you go? What do you do? I wanted to know so much more about what was going on, what my dad was doing. Is that why you're wearing that jumpsuit tuxedo thing? My dad ignored my questions and ruffled my hair instead. I love you, kiddo. See you soon. He turned to my mom and kissed her, and told her that he'd be back as soon as possible. Then he picked up the suitcase that I'd never seen before. And left. The next morning, the columns were gone. 
The space between the buildings and trees and streets and town were back to normal, and the sun tore through the blinds so sharply that it stung my eyes even as they were closed. I ran downstairs to find both my parents eating breakfast. Everything had returned to normal. Neither of them talked about the columns. They changed the subject whenever I brought them up. Soon I realized I was not going to get any more information from them. I gave up. As I left for school, my mom bent down and grabbed my chin so I had to stare her straight into her eyes. She gave me the most stern look I've ever seen. Andy, you are not to talk about the columns with anyone. You are not to talk about anything that happened yesterday, and you're not to talk about what your father told you. No one else will talk about it either, and if anyone does, and you talk about it with them, you'll both be in trouble. Your teacher knows this. Your friends know this. Their parents know this. People you've never met in this town know this. Do you understand me? And I think it was the look in her eyes more than anything else, but but I took what she said so seriously that I, I could feel it at the core of my soul. These were things that we were not going to talk about, and so I didn't. I went to school, and it was just a regular day. No one mentioned the column, no one mentioned the weird way the town had shifted to accommodate them. No one mentioned how they were gone the very next day. No one mentioned the six students from my school, including one girl from my class vanished, sometime between the day before the columns appeared and the day they disappeared, and were never seen again. The memories of that day never left, though. They sat inside me, unspoken for over a decade, looming like the columns over my every subconscious thought. I moved away from college, to a school where I didn't know many people, and so was forced to make new friends. Once I tried to tell them about the columns, but they thought I was joking. And as I was telling them about it, I realized how crazy it sounded. So I played it off and agreed that it was a joke. No one laughed. And I never mentioned it again. Anyway, as often happens when you're trying to make new friends, at that age where you're still trying to find yourself and what you do and don't like, I developed new interests, based on the interests of my new friends. My favorite, though, and the one that stuck with me ever since, was exploring abandoned places. Every time I'm a little scared of getting caught trespassing or something, and honestly that probably added to the thrill, but the real excitement is seeing those incredible places, sometimes in states of disrepair that you would never see in your day-to-day -day life, some of them looking perfectly preserved in time. There was an incredible abandoned resort outside of Orlando that had an indoor mini golf course and trees growing up and out of its solarium-inspired glass ceiling. And this tire plant in Georgia, where it looked like the workers had just not come in to work one day, and then, and the next, and eventually never again. All the machinery was still there, just waiting for someone to turn the power back on and get back to work. So when I went back home for Thanksgiving, I found out that the old municipal building had been shuttered, and new gleaming glass and case structures had been built a few blocks away. I knew I had to go see my dad's old workplace. But getting access wasn't hard. Even though it was located in the heart of the old downtown area, there were hardly any businesses left, either moving or larger outdoor malls scattered around the edge of town, or shuttered for good, having given up to e-commerce. So early on the morning of Black Friday, everyone in town was doing one of two things, sleeping or waiting in line far away from the aged downtown area. Even the police were keeping watch over the mobs of sale-hungry shoppers, and so I didn't even see a single patrol on my way to the old municipal building. I didn't know if the building had a guard, but if it did, he or she must have either had the night off or decided to spend it trying to score some crazy deal at one of the shopping centers, figuring no one would notice their absence on that night of all nights. The building was old, visibly so. It looked almost exactly like the city hall building from Back to the Future. Some bricks and round columns on the steps leading up to the main entrance. Even the same triangle shape at the roof line that at one time housed a large clock, but now just a large empty circle built into the building's face. It's a little weird that we describe buildings as having human body parts, like faces, isn't it? We describe everything in terms of the human body, honestly. It's like our own body is the only way we can truly understand the world around us. I was surprised to find every single window and door was boarded over, which seemed a little overkill for this place, but 
Getting in was still a simple matter. I knew from countless times driving by as a child that there are a set of stairs built into a sidewalk on the building's right side, leading down to a door directly into the building's basement. There's another thing we never talked about when I was little, or when I was growing up for that matter, that not a single building in town seemed to have a basement, save for the municipal building. I don't know why that occurred to me just now, I just, I guess you don't think about some things. The location of the door, below street level, virtually guaranteed that no one would see me prying off the plywood that covered the door, even though that was never a risk in this particular night. It gave me a peace of mind, though, as I pulled the small crowbar out of my backpack, brought along for this exact scenario. It took a minute or two, but soon the plywood was removed and set aside. It had been impossible to do silently, but the noise I'd made hadn't seemed to have stirred anyone, so I was feeling more brazen about my entry. The next obstacle, the locked door, didn't stand a chance. The wood holding the bolt in place was old and weathered and gave way with the first kick. I probably should have felt guilty about literally breaking and entering, but the thrill of exploration, combined with the number of times my college friends had dragged me out to do this exact thing with them before, had numbed me to it by this point. I was past feeling guilt for trespassing. I only felt curiosity, intense curiosity, as I remembered my dad telling me that he had to go to a special part of the building that day. I shuffled the plywood back into place so that a cursory glance by a passerby wouldn't appear too suspicious, and I closed the door as best I could. I grabbed a nearby chair and propped it against the door to hold it shut, and promised myself I'd nail the door shut on my way out. The beam of my flashlight dashed over a fairly mundane office, old, very out of date, and missing most office supplies but the skeleton of the office that had once been was easy to see. It was just missing computers and copy machines, telephones, and people milling about. Or so I thought. As I waved my flashlight again, I noticed the desks weren't missing computers. They'd never had them. Old typewriters, maybe from the 70s, I'd guess, were placed neatly at the center of each desk. Their plastic cases had discolored and yellowed to the point that the brand name was impossible to read, and the stickers affixed to the keys to label them had either peeled completely off or were almost there. But at one time, this had been a functional office. It had clearly stopped seeing use well before I'd first thought. But the bones were still here. Bones. People constantly talk about a building's bones. No one even thinks about it. I knew my dad used a computer every day at work. It had been early in the computer age, and I think he'd started with DOS, but I know the building's technology was moved beyond typewriters, even when I was a child. They just shuttered it a couple years ago. I know most of the building had been using up-to-date technology before they moved to the new location, so why? Why was this room stuck in time? Not only stuck, but apparently abandoned well before the change in location. Judging by the state of the typewriters, the room maybe had been abandoned since I was a kid. Maybe longer. I walked further into the room, examining the desks, looking for any scrap of paper that might give me an idea of the last time this room had seen use. This was my favorite part of exploring abandoned places, piecing a story together in my head, trying to understand what happened at this place. It felt sort of like what I imagined being an archaeologist feels like, except with concepts and technology that I inherently understand and don't need to consult reference books for. The desks seem void of any pieces of paper, so on a whim, I opened a drawer. Nothing. I moved another desk and opened the drawer. Found a three-hole puncher. Nothing informative. That third desk, though. It was a thick stack of bound papers. At least half an inch. A couple hundred pages, I guess. Most of the cover page was faded. But as I started flipping through it, it became clear it was some sort of report by a civil engineering firm. There were some graphs that meant nothing to me, some diagrams that may have been for the town's sewer system, and page after page of numbers like a spreadsheet made before Excel was a thing. Using my flashlight as a reading lamp, I went back to the first pages, which I figured would be an introduction to the document, explaining what I was looking at. Maybe give me some dates. Engineering projects had timelines, so I was looking for numbers, names, months, etc. As I was scanning through, I began to notice a phrase repeat itself, the concrete layer, capitalized just like that, like a proper noun, like it was a name. It became clear that the project I was holding was some sort of 
for lack of a better phrase, check up on whatever this concrete layer was. The engineering firm conducted a bunch of drilling operations, went down into the sewers, making sure this concrete layer, whatever that was, was intact and stable. But it went on. They checked lake beds, river beds. They had drilling sites spread out across at least 400 square miles, roughly a 20 mile by 20 mile square, encompassing the town and outlying communities. But all sites and investigations referred to the same singular concrete layer. Not various pieces of concrete foundation. One singular unit, like the entire town, shared one gigantic foundation. What the hell did that mean? I turned another page that was formatted differently from the rest of the report. It was on letterhead from the National Security Agency, and didn't seem to have anything to do with the survey, or at least not directly. It appeared to be more concerned with extending and ongoing agreements between the town and the U.S. Marshal that was made in the 1800s again with something called the Black Chamber in 1920. Apparently, the letter was to ensure ongoing cooperation between the town and the NSA, who took over handling the agreement sometime after the Black Chamber. It was dated September of 1976. I was reaching the point where I couldn't make sense of anything in the report when I turned one more page. A summary of the costs involved in the survey. A number of city officials had signed off on the cost, and there, third down, was my dad's name and signature. Whatever this concrete layer was, my dad knew about it. I put the report back in the drawer and moved my light around the room. I thought maybe I could find an office with more information, something that would make sense of what I had just read, something to explain why it seemed like a single piece of concrete foundation stretched for 400 miles under my town. Instead of an office, though, my light was drawn to something else. In the far left corner of the room, the paint on the wall stopped several feet out. There was nothing but bare cinder block moving into the corner, where instead of the two walls meeting was a single bare metal door. It took a moment for me to understand why my flashlight had gone straight there when I had meant to search the room in full, but as I looked at the door, and at the space around it, and at the space leading to that space, I realized that every single line in that room pointed to that corner and that door. It was like when you're Taking art in school and you learn about perspective and your teacher shows you what a vanishing point is, the point in a picture where all the perspective lines lead. They were all pointing to that corner, unfinished, proud in its bare cinder block, its solid blank door. I'm still not sure if I had no choice but to enter that door, but if my curiosity of the situation convinced me that I did, but I walked straight there, grabbed the L-shaped handle, and thrust it open. A smell came back to me that I still struggled to describe. There were several things separately, and all at once, it was the smell of earth, dirt, wet and pungent, and the smell of death and decay. Like life had been trapped behind that door and eventually succumbed to the passage of time. And it was the smell of sweet things, like barbecue sauce or ketchup. I pointed my light into the darkness and found a plain, unfinished concrete staircase leading down. The walls equally plain and cement, giving no handhold. So I took my time with each step, knowing I had nothing to catch myself on if I lost my balance. The staircase continued down for some time. I tried to count steps, but lost count after 75, and then I continued down for at least as much longer, maybe more. Eventually it came to rest in a large, perfectly rectangular room, cast entirely in concrete. There was only one door about 200 feet away at the other end, and nothing on the walls or floor. The ceiling loomed oppressively overhead. As I walked across the room, I began to hear a faint humming. At least, I think I was hearing it. I may have been more feeling it than hearing it. In any case, the closer I got to the other side, the more I felt vibration in my body, down to my bones. I noticed it wasn't constant, but was rather rhythmic. A steady thrumming coming from somewhere beyond the door, somewhere beyond and below. I reached the door and found that rather than being metal, like the one that led to the staircase, this one was concrete, like the rest of the room. The only metal was the hinges that it swung on. There was a hole the size of my fist to reach in and pull from. Before putting my fingers in, I bent down and examined the hole from every angle with my flashlight. Finally confident that there was nothing in it but more bare concrete, I reached in with all the strength I had and pulled the door toward me, open. 
It was a struggle, but the hinges appeared in surprisingly good shape. I would have expected them to be rusted to hell and back, but they appeared... well cared for. The challenge came from the weight of the door itself. Putting my foot against the wall to help apply leverage, I was eventually able to get the door open wide enough to slip through. I peeked in and illuminated what I could find with my light. I couldn't really understand what I was seeing. Just on the other side of the door, the walls shifted from unfinished concrete to something even more primitive. It looked like adobe clay, the kind that indigenous people built things out of thousands of years ago. It was rough to the touch, but warm. Surprisingly warm. Beyond the door, another staircase plunged downward again, this one made out of the same adobe as the walls around it. The air was growing stifling. I couldn't even begin to estimate how far underground I was. I was beyond trying to understand why this passage was located beneath the municipal building. I'd even mostly forgotten about the concrete layer, now driven only by a maddening need to know where this series of blank staircases and corridors led. I walked down the stairs for maybe five minutes, but strangely, I wasn't sure. It felt like about five minutes, and logic told me I'd walked about five minutes down the stairs, but also, I had the slightest, most vague memories of having walked down these stairs for years, and years, maybe even decades. I had indistinct, dreamlike memories of having lived a substantial part of my life walking down that staircase. When I reached the bottom, I felt much older mentally and physically. I felt my face and body, but it no longer felt like mine. I didn't understand. Everything felt wrong, like a bad trip. I walked down another long, blank corridor made out of adobe and found that the other end had a doorway, but no door, just some straw hanging across it. I wondered how long the straw had been there. How long did dried straw last? I had no idea. I pushed it aside and walked across and immediately threw myself to the ground. I found myself on an elevated walkway, also made out of adobe, in the middle of a chamber that was so large. I could not see its walls. Only where the concrete ceiling, hundreds of feet above me, eventually sloped over the horizon. The thrumming had grown so loud I could, I could feel it in the core of my soul. The walkway was only a few feet wide and only extended another twenty or so before plunging down into the adobe floor of the chamber hundreds of feet below. I scrambled for my flashlight, only to realize I didn't need it. Somehow, something was illuminating the chamber. There were subtle cracks in the adobe floor far below me, and some, some more light was pouring through them, but it wasn't a color I can describe. I'm not sure it was a color at all. I honestly don't know what it was, but it let me see. All around me, as far as the horizon would allow, the adobe clay ground stretched, and at regular intervals, perfectly square columns, made out of adobe clay, lazily bobbed up and down. Not the way the ocean moves, or even the way a field of grass moves in the wind. The movement of the columns was lazy, but there was no mistaking that the movements were that of a living being. There was purpose to them. They moved in rhythm with a thrumming and realized I had been feeling this moment in my body since the cement core all those steps ago. That's how powerful the movement of this ground was. Carefully I crawled to the edge of the walkway and I peered down, pointing my flashlight down, more out of muscle memory than need, but, but I'll, I'll never forget what I saw. Directly below the end of the walkway was a pile of human bones, dozens of feet tall, maybe more. Size was almost impossible to estimate in the maddening chamber. Clothes were even visible, wrapped around the bones on the top. The bones further down looked much, much older. The ones nearest the bottom, or as far down as I could see them, had been disintegrated into dust. As quickly as I had seen the bones, though, something happened. The adobe floor of the chamber, as though reacting to the light I'd shown on it, roared to life. Columns shot up at regular intervals with incredible speed. They crashed into the ceiling, but somehow, kept going. Everything around me shook. I turned and ran. I ran and ran and ran. I almost passed out on those stairs a couple times, but it felt like the stairwells were going to collapse at any moment, and my survival instinct kept me going. After some length of time, I even, even less clear on how long it took me to run up as it did to go down, I eventually made it back to the bizarre, unused office. I ran out the door and into the front final few steps towards the street, and I couldn't believe what I saw. 
towering over me. At regular intervals, scattered for miles and miles, dwarfing everything else in the world with a column. The same ones I'd seen when I was nine. The next day the columns were out, but my parents and I didn't mention them. I went to sleep that night and left the next morning. The columns had vanished overnight. Three weeks later, I read an article online about a woman who said that her sister lived in my town and had a daughter. The woman said, The sister's daughter disappeared the day after Thanksgiving, but the sister won't talk to her. And the town's police said, so they looked into the report and concluded it was unfounded. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Because this is October, I'm going to make this nice, short, and sweet. If you'd like to help support the show or the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. If you'd like to get yourself some new Halloween and Creepypasta inspired teas, you can head over to etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And if you want to catch me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew during our live Halloween tour around the southern U.S., head over to creepypasta.showfetty.com. That's creepypasta.s-h-o-f-e-t-t-i.com. Hang on to your hats, kids, because this year is a 31-day Halloween countdown. Happy Halloween, and sweet dreams.